are truly essential to the maintenance of freedom in many kinds of geography, including mine. So if by sheer good luck you find your way into this blessed veil of our strange discipline, you really must accept and uphold a code of ethical and polite behavior when dealing with other geographers. All too often we fail at this. The cardinal rule is that you respect all kinds of geography. Never try to restrict our freedoms. Never seek to impose censorship or orthodoxies upon your fellow geographers. Push no exclusivist agendas. Engage in no intellectual evangelism. Do not under any circumstances proselytize for your particular kind of geography. And whatever you do, take no measures that might divide physical from human geography. We simply must not allow that to happen. That would finish us off as a discipline. And yet I see abundant evidence that we are allowing this to happen. These are the two principal kinds of geography. They underlie all the others. And they form a symbiosis. Now we perhaps imagine that cultural ecology is sufficiently powerful to bind the two as it has in the past. But it's not. The joints are crumbling. Idea bouncing. Do, on the other hand, by all means, bounce ideas off your fellow geographers, both physical and human. We desperately need such exchanges. That helps preserve both the discipline as a whole and your kind of geography from stagnation. One of the greatest threats we face is that lacking a clear focus and definition, we will let even the smaller kinds of geography bleed away into neighboring, more specialized fields of learning. It happens all the time, usually one by one people just drift out of our valley unless we talk to them. Oh yes, I know, we take in new refugees in exchange. Some of you may be refugees. But we lose too many of our own. The Russian geographer Gumilov said it best. Our discipline combines, quote, the river of holistic knowledge diverted long ago by many into the irrigation ditches of specialized disciplines. End quote. We must work against those powerful separating currents. Balance your ideas gently, like skipping flat rocks across a still pond. Do not be arrogant and throw them at the skulls of geographers who pursue different types. Your kind of geography is not better than anyone else's. This code of ethics extends to both the living and the dead. Do not discard the geographers of the past. I think I can correctly say I have always learned something useful and valuable when I read something by a geographer living or dead. This is one of our greatest strengths and it is one thing that causes us to be different from most other disciplines who wad up and throw away their used scholars. <coughs> Retain the past. Protect our heritage. This too is the proper inclusionist thing to do. Yes, you can embrace fads and draw them into the fold, but do not be faddish to the point where you begin disparaging or discarding what is not fashionable. 
No, don't let shoddy work pass without criticism. But confine your comments to the quality and not the kind or type of geography that's involved. Geo Nazis. Now, simple and unburdened as these modest rules and restrictions are, they really place almost no meaningful burden on any of us. It seems that not everybody wants to obey them. More often than we would like, evangelizers and zealots stray among us. Invariably, these intellectual fascists or ideologues seek to remold us and push their kind of geography at the expense of ours. We often attach the word determinist to them, and fittingly so. They come wearing all kinds of stripes, and perhaps few among them realize that they are potential destroyers. Or maybe they do. And they're simply so insecure about their kind of geography that they feel the need for a herd mentality. Regardless how totalitarian their behavior, we can always learn something from these people, and they from us, if they choose. We should not respond to their attempted pogroms with one's aim to destroy them. Their attempts invariably fail anyway, and useful residue remains behind. My first encounter with geo-Nazis came in the 1960s. What they informed us, among other things, was that regional geography had died. The cause and justification for its passing was its, quote, purely descriptive nature, end quote. Nothing could have been less true. It had not died. Nor had it ever been anything even remotely approaching remotely descriptive. I'm sorry, purely descriptive. They must not have read that most magnificent of regional geographies ever written in the English language, Ellen Churchill Simple's The Geography of the Mediterranean Region. Somehow they had missed Dan Stanislavski's The Individuality of Portugal. Why they hadn't even seen Ed Foscue and Langdon White's textbook, The Regional Geography of Anglo-America. Those books are not devoid of explanation. These particular accusers were economic determinists. We who did not agree with them had better jump on their quantitative theoretical bandwagon right now or we were going to be tossed in the dustbin. They had dragged a lot of ideas in from other disciplines supposedly superior to our own. And there's nothing wrong with interdisciplinary exchange, so long as its intent is not destructive. These modernists, another name they went by, tried to make of us the givers of spatial laws and advocates of socioeconomic determinism. Well, they got one bounced idea from the pen of gentle Ann Buttimer that they certainly noticed. She said, and did, that we should expect more depth from geography than, quote, the dance macabre of materially motivated robots. After that, some modernists lost much of their fervor. very nearly melting down like the Wicked Witch of the West in Oz. A handful even recanted, though we didn't.